tidbit to what was said before about uh, Lovecraft's um, love of this church. You remember the famous passage in the call of Cthulhu, where uh, part of which is set across the street uh, in the Fleur de Lis building, of the, uh, an artist studio then and now. Now Lovecraft hated that building because it was, it was, it was Victorian. Uh, anything Victorian was, uh, was a subject of, uh, of loathing for him. And what he wrote in the call of Cthulhu was, there's the Fleur de Lis building, uh, in Thomas Street, a hideous Victorian imitation of 17th century Breton architecture which flaunts its stuccoed front amidst the lovely colonial houses on the ancient hill and under the very shadow of the finest Georgian steeple in America. <laughs> so, uh, so that bad, this is good. <laughs> um, what I hope to address here briefly, if possible, uh, briefly, is um, how did Lovecraft get to be world famous? He certainly wasn't world famous in his time. He was a man who did not publish a single book of his stories in his lifetime. Five different occasions, publishers approached him or he approached the publisher about a collection. Every time, those negotiations failed for one reason or another. At the very end of his life, only one Book. One story appeared as a separate book, The Shadow Over Innsmouth, and it was uh, poorly printed, full of typographical errors, distributed only a few hundred copies. I do not doubt that Lovecraft, as he lay dying in his hospital bed at Jane Brown Memorial Hospital, not far from here, in the early morning hours of March 15, 1937, was envisioning the ultimate oblivion that would overtake his work lost as it was in those crumbling pulp magazines which were already then disintegrating into dust, weird tales, astounding stories, amazing stories, let alone his essays and poetry and letters, some of which had never been published. It would be no surprise if he thought that his work would simply fade away with his own body. But his survival, at least in the short term, was uh, the result of the great devotion of his friends. Robert Barlow, his literary executor, only 19 years old, took a long bus ride from Kansas to Providence to go through his papers after his death and donated the bulk of them to the John Hay Library. An act of incredible foresight because those papers laid the foundation for what, uh, for later scholarship that would uh, raise him to, to, to world stature. August Derleth and Donald Wanderai spent their own money and their time and effort to start the publishing firm Markham House for the specific purpose of, of publishing Lovecraft stories in hardcover. And those, those editions were well received at the start, although I think some reviewers uh, looked upon them more as a tribute to friendship than for, for their purely literary worth. Weird fiction at that time was uh, not highly regarded as a literary form. Uh, most mainstream critics did not believe that you could write genuine literature of, the, of horror and the supernatural. Indeed, in 1945, Edmund Wilson, uh, then so-called Dean of American Critics, the leading uh, literary critic in this country, decided to review some of Lovecraft's works, and his judgment was not favorable. He said, in a book review that published in The New Yorker, 1945, the only real horror in most of these fictions is the horror of bad taste and bad art. Well, that doesn't sound very good. Well, Mr. Wilson may have thought he was burying Lovecraft, but Lovecraft refused to be buried. The first paperback edition of Lovecraft emerged right around that time, and they may not have been distributed widely, but they again set the stage uh, for his later renaissance. The 1950s actually were a rather lean period for Lovecraft's uh, work in general. Arkham House was going through some tough times, could not keep Lovecraft's work in print. Um, uh, they themselves only published a few titles in that whole decade. But interesting things were happening overseas. The first editions of Lovecraft in England appeared in, in uh, early 1951. A few years later, more surprisingly, Lovecraft became uh, translated into foreign languages. First in France in 1954, and then in Spain in 1957. The French, as they had done a century before with Poe, hailed Lovecraft as an exemplary writer of what they called the fantastique. 
The French had no prejudice against horror fiction as a literary genre, and so they championed Lovecraft. French, uh, 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 German translations, uh, Italian translations followed uh, soon thereafter. In the early 1960s, Arkham House was able to reprint uh, Lovecraft fiction in three substantial volumes and keep those volumes in print. The revenue from those editions, for those editions, actually came from those early film adaptations of Lovecraft. We remember them all: The Haunted Palace, Die Monster Die, The Shuttered Room. There can't be, and, and perhaps a little proof, but they, they, they gave some money to Arkham House, and that was good. They, they started uh, planting the seed of Lovecraft's great uh, emergence as a figure in popular culture. Indeed, as the, 70s, as the 60s advanced, a very strange thing happened. Horror fiction all of a sudden became a best-selling phenomenon. Ira Levin published Rosemary's Baby in 1967. William Peter Blatty published uh, The Exorcist in 1971, and then the early novels of Stephen King started publication in the early 70s. Lovecraft rode the crest of that popularity. Those Arkham House editions were reprinted by Lancer books and then by Valentine books, and sold over a million copies, apparently, over the next several years. So Lovecraft has become firmly implanted in popular consciousness, indeed to such an extent that uh, Time magazine took notice of Lovecraft in its June 11, 1973 issue in a, in a lengthy review. But popularity is one thing. Critical esteem is a very different thing. Literary history is littered with the corpses of popular writers who then faded from the scene and deserved to fade. Their popularity was a transient phenomenon uh, subject to time and, uh, and, and whim. Would Lovecraft meet that same fate? Perhaps not. What happened in the 1970s is that shortly after August Gerlach's death in 1971, a new crop of Lovecraft scholars emerged to take Lovecraft much more seriously than, than had been done in the past, to study him more searchingly with greater analytical skill. Critics like Dirk W. Mosley, Kenneth Fay, David E. Schultz, Barton Zeynarmont, and Professor Brown, Peter Kennan. Their work was, in a sense, showcased at one of the great events that this city has held, the first World Fantasy Convention, held in, in Providence in 1975, theoretically to celebrate the entire realm of weird fiction, but it had a significant Lovecraft component, and there were many individuals, from Mosig uh, to uh, Fritz Leiber to Robert Bloch and Frank Belknap Long, who all came to celebrate Lovecraft's legacy. This is about the time when I emerged on the scene in a very tentative manner. As a teenager, I had read Lovecraft in my public library in Muncie, Indiana. And I knew that I had to study this curious Providence writer. I knew I had to come here to absorb the influence of Lovecraft and to, to, to get a sense of, of, of what he meant uh, as a writer and as a thinker. Luckily, I was accepted at Brown and spent the next six years there doing as much research as I possibly can while still attending classes. I did, I did a significant amount of work, including the bibliography, and, and I spent years correcting Lovecraft's texts. They had been printed with many errors in, in previous editions, but I, I corrected most of those. And these were reprinted by Arkham House in the 1980s. They gained a, a bit of a, a, attention, but, but Lovecraft was still very far from achieving uh, renown as a, as a leading writer of world literature. However, around that time, other scholars emerged. Stephen J. Maraconda, Robert M. Price, with his very lively magazine, Crypt of Clue. Yeah. Will Murray, yeah, I hope Price is here somewhere. He's a great guy. Um, um, Robert H. Wall. The work of these scholars was uh, commemorated in another great event that it took place here, the H.P. Lovecraft Centennial Conference, uh, held at Brown. Uh, and uh, featuring many scholars from around the world who came to speak on a very hot August weekend. Uh, and at the end of that event, we had the unveiling of the H.P. Uh, Lovecraft Memorial plaque, which is now on the grounds of the John Hay Library. 
I think a lot of us at that time felt that maybe that was the, the, the acme of Lovecraft's recognition. A major university had sponsored uh, a, a good academic convention. He was a popular writer. Oh, what's this? Expanded around the world. 
those early translations in Europe have given way to still newer editions. Lafrev is now in Russian, in Estonian, in Turkish, in Serbo-Croatian, in Bengali, in Chinese, in Japanese, in modern Greek. Truly, Lafrev belongs to the world. And yet, in the most fundamental sense, he remains a uniquely American, a uniquely Rhode Island phenomenon. Let us remember what is written on his tombstone at Swan Point Cemetery, not far from here. I am Providence. I am Providence. What a wealth of, 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 of meaning lies in those simple words. How profoundly they speak of Lovecraft's attachment to this city. Its architecture, its topography, its history, now almost 400 years old, its people. Lovecraft traveled up and down the eastern seaboard, from Quebec to Key West, but he always came back to Providence. It was not merely his home, it was his haven, it was his sanctuary. It was the only place he felt he belonged, the only place where he felt he could be the man and the writer he wished to be. And so it is fitting that we have come from the four corners of the earth to celebrate his life and his legacy. I have to believe that he